thank you so much once again, Remus. Well, thank being... you, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a it's a real joy, especially um, to speak to you because you are really, for many people, the gateway to contemporary Lithuanian poetry. I mean, I think translators are underappreciated, especially when they are like yourself, a poet and then a translator too. But your work is is pretty pretty constant and pretty selfless, and you're helping a couple of generations of Lithuanian poets. It, it feels to me. I don't know if that's well, your perception. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's all selfless in in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, I do feel like I'm doing some good for some other people. You know, when you work on your own poems, it's your own stuff, and and with translation, you you do have that sense that uh, that other people are are grateful uh, that you're helping get their work out. So so there is that aspect, and that's that is a nice change from just chugging along with your own writing. Uh, you know, you do feel like you're doing some good for, for the literary community and, 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 and even, you know, the, the society in a cultural way. Um, but, you know, they also pay me and so, and, and they've sent me to nice places to present the, the translations. And, you know, I got to go to London and Manchester in 2018. And so, so there's definitely good things for me too. And I, and I, and I'm really, I've really been enjoying, uh, the work and in, in, in the presentation of translated poetry and and so it's it's become a, a career for me uh, at least part of my career and uh, it's a it's a part of me too so uh, you know it's uh, it, it's it's become a nice sort of seamless whole where where everyone benefits right uh, and uh, so so yeah I think that's a generous way to see it. I completely understand. I think I feel the same way when people talk about me organizing events, you know, it does help other people, but to a certain extent, it's, it's also my work, you know? So as long as you can facilitate it that way, it makes you feel like you're not necessarily being selfless while you also are, especially in your case, I think benefiting others. And I think in your case, it's for a couple, couple of reasons. One of them definitely is that uh, Lithuania and the identity of Lithuania in the last 20, 30, 40 years is obviously something different and is something that's gone through enormous changes. And so by you being such a respected translator to the point where a publisher like Blood Axe will, you know, publish books with poets who won't be known in England because you translated them to a certain extent, you, you are really allowing to the biggest uh, language world uh, on the planet English a lot of people to get a taste of what's happening in contemporary Lithuanian literature so I'm interested in your perception of that you know is there a changing and a new identity in Lithuania that's connected to the poetry well sure uh there is it's, it's not uh it's not terribly easy to put your finger on it exactly uh certainly uh the 20th century saw a lot of the neo-romantic poets. Uh, it was a kind of combination of neo-romanticism and, and modernism. And, and Lithuania didn't have this sort of modernist revolution uh, that occurred in English, uh, especially with the American modernists uh, just totally redoing things for, for American poetry. Uh, England, I guess, was had a little more continuity, uh, uh, but Eliot and Pound were over there agitating things and, and changing things. Um, and uh, and so, so Lithuania didn't, you know, there was a brief period between the wars uh, when there was a lot of experimentation, like everywhere in Europe, and, and there were some Dada poets even, and, and, and then it all just got shut down, right? It just the war happened, the Soviet occupation happened, and, and that pretty much stopped. <clears throat> and, uh, and then there was, a, you know, poets who were trying to conform more to the Soviet requirements. And then there was the, the counter poets who were, were often the best poets. Um, and they tended to draw on a kind of neo-romantic strain that was more deeply connected to the natural environment of Lithuania and to its sense of identity as this old agrarian society that you know uh, was connected to the land and, and that was a, a, a locus of great importance and a sense of uh, 
a true Lithuanian identity that wasn't part of the whole Soviet uh, system of modernization and factory work and collectivization, right? And so, so even simple poems about nature and the farm became a, almost a kind of resistance um, to, to Soviet society. And that lasted for a long time in, in various ways and, 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 you know, they became more modern. They, they, they were able to read uh, at least a number of works uh, uh, from, from the modernist tradition. Not everything was available, of course, but, but they had some access uh, through Polish, especially, uh, you know, they learned to read Polish a lot of people and, and could get more books. And so there was a, a development. Uh, it wasn't straightforward sort of romanticism, but it still had a lot of that in it. And uh, after independence uh, in 1990 or 1991, uh, 1990 officially, but uh, there was you know a lot of chaos still in in, in the January events of 91. And but uh, and basically in the 90s uh, there was a kind of a huge revolution and a jump to postmodernism, and uh, just a massive experimentation and different kinds of uh, it happened not just in poetry but in all the art forms, uh, different kinds of writing, different uh, styles, uh, different outlooks, and, 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 and some using irony, some using fragmented language, and, and, and some moving more towards a sort of recently uh, American lyrical narrative tradition, narrative lyric, I should say. And so, so there's been a lot of uh, different kinds of poetics that have arisen in these last 30 years. And, uh, and, and you can't say anymore that there's a, a clear school of Lithuanian poetry. Uh, uh, maybe you could have earlier, but, but it's, it's gotten much harder to, to put your finger on, you know, some one kind of way Lithuanians are writing. Um, it, yeah, it tends to be melancholy, right? Okay, we, we, it tends to be sort of sadder than, than American poetry, uh, usually, but... Uh, you know, so there's certain things you can maybe say are still part of a Lithuanian character. Um, but, but in terms of style and, and different poetic forms, there, there's all kinds of things happening. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, it, it, it's exciting, you know. Uh, well, that's exactly, yeah. exactly how I feel, yeah. Um, it feels exciting when you go as an outsider. You know, and part, part of my experience of it is doing research before I invite poets, but also before I go to places like Lithuania. And um, a lot of that's through your translation. So in a way, that that's really the core thing. Navigating that variation of style is something that, in a way, we, we I think culturally, in literary circles, we, over, we do overlook the translator, even though that's been recently addressed in certain circles. Yeah, I mean, the, the overlooking still happens and, and uh, it, it can be a bummer sometimes to, uh, I mean, of course, you know, look, uh, Blood Axe has done a good job, uh, you know, in my Grajowska's book, they've got my name on the cover, you know, I can't, and, and Shearsman too, Shearsman did it too with, with their Yudita uh, Vaichunete book, uh, my name is on the cover too. And uh, hey, you know, uh, that's respect. And I, I, I'm very happy about that. And it's very nice of them to do that. Um, so, so yes, there has been a lot of progress in giving respect to, to translators, I would say. But still, you know, I, I translated the uh, libretto for uh, the operetta Sun and Sea, which won the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennial Festival last year. Uh, it was written by Vaiva Grainite, uh, music by Lina Lapelite. And, uh, and I was the translator, and, and of course they credited me. I, I, they had a lot of respect for my work. Um, but every review I read in English, certainly, did not even mention that it was translated, right? The, you know, the people are singing in English in, in Venice, and, and uh, the reviews, uh, I think this was LRB, New York Times, and then some other one, uh, and, and none of them mentioned even that it was translated, right? It was as if it was just written in English. And I thought, you know, come on, you know, at least give me a footnote, right? You just like some time, <laughs> just mention it, right? Um, so, so it still happens and it, it, and it can be kind of weird when that happens. You think, well, what happened? What, what are you people thinking? Um, but, uh, 
but you know, what, what can we do? I, I just be grateful when people, uh, you know, call attention to us and, and, and say something. I, th I think it is disrespectful. I think respect is the right word to use because I do think, I, I wonder what it comes from. I mean, sometimes I think it has to do with the um, ubiquity of English, but being basically monolingual myself, I wonder, is it the confidence of English being the, the language of North America and obviously uh, the history of England? Or is it something to do with the perception of what translation is in literature and the history of literature? Because often people talk to me about collaboration. Uh, you generously have performed collaborations at a couple of my events and, and, and wonderfully, obviously you're a very good collaborator, but precisely because when I'm asked about it and the history of collaboration in poetry, I say, don't overlook translation and editorial work as collaborative forms right you reference pound and elliot famously you know their collaboration is what right. created to a certain extent elliot so I, I wonder if it's that it's to do with the verb where the translation itself indicates some sort of perception in the reader that it just exists it just arrives in english you know dostoevsky wrote in english and it just right. arrives in your door i wonder what you think that is that kind of invisibility it could be, it could be, it could have something to do with that. You know, everybody in Europe pretty much knows English and certainly everyone with college educations. And uh, a lot of people are writing in English even who's, who don't have it as a native language. And, and, uh, and so maybe there is this sense like, oh, it's an English, it was probably just written in English, right? Uh, it could be people that just don't even bother to ask and, and to wonder. Uh, I, I'm really not sure. It might be something weird about the uh, the genre of the you know the opera or the the performance art because uh, it was sort of on the borderline of not quite an opera but, but sort of an operetta performance art. Maybe the genre has something to do with it. Like people there aren't used to asking this question or thinking about it, and they just accept it as English. Uh, so so anyway, uh, that sort of thing does happen. Well, congratulations, nonetheless. That's an enormous achievement because without your work, that obviously couldn't have taken place. So you are, obviously that's a huge achievement on your part. Well, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good collaboration. Again, you mentioned collaboration and, and that, that kind of work really does have that aspect because you know, we got together with the composer and the, the librettist, uh, Viva and Linda, and we uh, had to hash it out because you know, I translated it first and then you know, there were a lot of questions and issues of fitting the, the music. And, and I had uh, sort of bent over backwards trying to get every line to fit the rhythm of the music. Uh, according, you know, doing syllable counts, uh, and and some of it wasn't very natural, and 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 so they kept asking, you know, can we make it more natural? I kept saying, well, yeah, if you want to change the music, <laughs> you know, and so we had to really work it out, see what could be changed and, and what what couldn't be changed, and and uh, and so that that again was a project that was a really nice change from from the usual writer sitting there by him or herself at a desk, right. Uh, we, we, we had to work together to, to make it happen. That's, yeah, that's truly a collaboration. I mean, because that's inc incredibly technical. I mean, a lot, a lot of the reason I think translators are not seen on par with the authors is be because of the history of poetry and the genius, you know, the, the mythological um, hierarchy of creation. The author created it. And then the translator just did a version, which is absolutely not the case. I mean, the translator created it from a version that's not accessible to the next language. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've said in an interview that we're we're in a way sort of sort of like actors or or musicians. You know, uh, you know, sure, Beethoven wrote the Moonlight Sonata, but you know we all give credit to the way people play it, right? And, and certain versions get a lot of fame and certain performers get a lot of fame for their interpretations of it. And so why shouldn't it be the same with translators, right? I mean, we're, you know, uh, we're bringing it to life in, in that new language and, and, and we're like a performer or an, or an actor in that way. Uh, so, so, so I do think there, there's room there for, for respecting translators more uh, uh, but but you're right that that generally they they've sort of been forgotten behind this myth of the the great creator. 
Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that metaphor is such a powerful one. My experience when I first started to collaborate with musicians, like writing small librettos, and they have an almost military down to earthedness because their, their fundamental creative practice is most often interpretation and not creation. And therefore that the ego um, is somewhat secondary. And I think poetry perhaps might be the most um, rarefied art in that regard, that we almost need to protect the singular individual and the creative process because we're afraid somehow that poetry might just dissipate and float off into the wind. If it's collaborative, if it's using found text, if it's collage, if it's translated, it's almost like that takes a, a cut off its power for people before they've even read it, which I find completely alarming and alien. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I think that's also a legacy of romanticism in a way. Uh, the great genius creator is, is primary. Uh, uh, of course, you know, those attitudes should be changing, right? To some extent they have, right? We're, we're talking about it. And, and we've had over a hundred years of, of collage works now. So, so it really, you know, I think, you know, yeah, with time, more and more people will, will, will start to move away from that, that, that mythology. Um, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I think the reference point you made to England and modernism doesn't hold much hope for me because I think we had it and didn't really continue it in, in the mainstream perception of poetry. But I, I do think um, there's a lot of work happening, like your work and my work and a lot of other people all over Europe, especially where people are trying to flatten that curve. And part of that is recognizing translation, which, which leads me to my second kind of compliment for the work that you've done in, in Lithuania. What, what I found when I first started to work with European poets, which was about a year into me being reading at all poetry about 10 years ago, is that translation to a young European poet, especially from certain nations like Baltic nations, is almost, I don't mean this in a, in a professional or, or, or mercenary way, it's almost a career step. Whereas in the UK, when I tried, I worked with the organization Lyric Line and I was offering young UK poets translations, they weren't that fussed. I mean, I couldn't motivate them to be translated into Lithuanian, say, they, they couldn't perceive the, the benefit of that, or it certainly was alien to them. But when I spoke to young, say, Hungarian poets, they would speak of one translator, someone like George Sertes in, in the UK, and be like, if I can get translated by George, you understand what I'm saying? And I think, I think that a lot of Lithuanian poets perceive your work that way. So I wonder, is it like that? Do you feel like, to a certain extent, that, that that's how it works for Lithuanian poets and translators? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, Lithuanians tend to be a little, uh, what's the expression, close, keep their, keep their cards close, or <laughs> uh, they don't, they, they're not very outspoken often in, in these sorts of things. And, and it's not like, you know, an American poetry culture where you have a reading and people slap you on the back and they're like, good job. Uh, here, you're happy if they invite you back, right? <laughs> <laughs> They don't give out a lot of uh, public compliments and so on. So, so it's actually not so easy for me to know. Uh, I, I just know from the fact that, that people keep asking me to translate that, that I must be doing something good. Um, um, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to compare myself with George Sh Shirt Sirtesh. Uh, uh, you know, he's got the T.S. Eliot Prize and, and many years of great poetry books. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, to some extent, because people keep asking me to do work, uh, you know, I do feel like uh, th there's something to it and, and I should keep, keep going, right? Uh, you know, it, it, it is nice, you know, especially if you're having trouble, you know, you're going through a period of getting your own poems rejected from journals. And, and especially in COVID times, you know, I haven't had a reading in so long in English, right, especially in... And uh, you wonder, you know, what am I doing? But, you know, uh, the translation is something that really sort of keeps you going and lifts you up sometimes because, you know, people want, your, want you to do the work and they, they, they like it and, and you feel like, okay, uh, you know, this is something good and I'm going to keep going. Um, so, you know, of course, I want to, to sort of be a person who helps Lithuanians get out in the world. 
but uh, but it's also hard to be sort of the one person. Uh, I'm not the only person, but but I, these days I'm sort of the only person who does a lot of it, right? We have a, other poetry translators, but they only do a little bit here and there. They have other careers and, you know, they, they're not really as committed to doing a lot of work every year. Uh, and, and, and the difficulty for me is, is getting those contacts with the rest of the world. You know, I, I, I get stuck in, in my work and I'm teaching and, and translating and, and working on my own poems and, and then my family. And, and then, you know, I don't have time to go and meet publishers and, and, and chit chat and, and make those personal connections that, that are often very important. And uh, I often don't have time to write lots of letters uh, to, to, you know, offer work and, uh, and, and uh, what's it called, uh, to, to really argue for, for certain pieces that they should be published. Uh, uh, I've got a lot of, you know, fragments and, and excerpts and, and I just never get time to sit down and really try to get them published uh, as books. So, so you know, uh, I, I need help too. And, and we're trying to, to work on that in Lithuania and the Culture Institute is, is trying. And, and uh, the thing is Lithuanians are, are actively being translated into lots of languages, uh, especially around Europe. And so, so the, the Culture Institute's limited in what it can do with, with the English language world, which sometimes fe feels farther away, you know, uh, um, way over there in Great Britain, you know, it's <laughs> as opposed to next door neighbors like Poland or, or, or Russian or Ukrainian or, you know, uh, Latvian and Estonian, right? We meet up with them pretty often. So, <clears throat> So, uh, so it, it, you know, it is difficult sometimes uh, in, in the English world, as you know, doesn't publish a lot of translations. That's a, another difficulty that we have. Uh, uh, most countries around us here publish a huge percentage of translations. Uh, there's a lot of them on the market. Uh, in Britain and America are not so good with that. And, and then when you talk about poetry and translation, uh, it's even, you know, a smaller piece of the pie. And so it really takes a lot of effort to, to find the publishers and get those books out there. And, uh, and that's one of the difficulties uh, th that I'm finding. You know, 2018 was great because London had the Baltic nations as uh, guests of honor and, and the publishers were interested and the Culture Institute invited them here and, and there was a lot of connections and, and those connections bore fruit. And, uh, and then the fair was over, 2018 passed, and, and then we're thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> back to the beginning again, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's an interesting, difficult situation in some ways, but, uh, but at the same time, we're, we're moving along pretty well. Is there a strong connection between, I know historically Poland, Lithuania, even over say poets like Czesław Miłosz have had a, an interesting relationship, but is there a strong connection in terms of your work and translations, the literary scene, the readings between the Baltic nations and Poland and, and that region? Does it feel like it's part of something that is quite neighborly and close or, or is it different nation to nation? Uh, I, I think it changes a little bit, but but there is that sense of neighbor, neighborliness for sure. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of Lithuanian writers learned uh, Polish uh, in the Soviet era because it Poland had published more books from the West. It was a little more free, and so they had more access to to culture that way. And uh, and because almost everybody you know my age and younger. Uh, learned Russian here, those who grew up here, I did not, uh, they could learn Polish pretty easily, especially, you know, living uh, in Vilnius, they could watch Polish TV. And so uh, that linguistic connection really helped when, you know, the, the 20th century poets uh, from Poland, you know, became world famous and, and the Lithuanian poets could read them and translate them and, and, uh, and they felt a connection with their work and and Miwash, of course, has always said he's from Lithuania. Uh, and he, in fact, he was born in Lithuania and went to, to, to university here in Vilnius. And, and, uh, and so, yes, we have that connection. And it's not just historical. It's, uh, you know, uh, 
it didn't end when Miwash died or anything. You know, we still have uh, poets who go to Poland for uh, translators, uh, um, not quite conferences, what is it, a kind of a retreat, uh, translators retreats where Polish and Lithuanian poets, poets and translators get together and translate each other's work and, and then publish that in, in journals. And, and uh, with Latvia and Estonia, we've been doing a lot of projects together. We're actually starting a new uh, English language journal uh, called No More Amber. Um, and uh, we, we've just came up with a name this summer. Um, the great and, uh, name. Yeah, it, it was a meeting in, in Riga, and we finally came up with the name, No More Amber, a uh, review of Baltic literature, something like that. And, uh, and so we're, we're, we have plans now for publishing that in the spring, and uh, we, we have funding for it from all three governments, and, uh, and so we're, we're starting to work on the translations. And uh, so, so, you know, that's an exciting collaborative project. Uh, but the thing we realized, uh, the difficulty in coming up with a title we had was that, you know, we and the Latvians have things in common. Uh, besides sharing a border, our languages have similarities in a common history, both Baltic languages. And uh, the Latvians and the Estonians have a lot in common because they were both ruled by the, uh, the German Livonian order. They were both Hanseatic trading cities, Tallinn and Riga. And, and so they had the, this, and pro, they're Protestant and we're Catholic. So they had this, this connection there. Um, but then we thought, well, what do we have to, that connects us to Estonia? Besides the fact that we're just called the Baltic states. <laughs> and it was actually very hard to figure out. You know, we, we've just sort of been thrown together as the three Baltic states. And so we, we sort of gone along with that and we're friendly, and, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's not so easy to figure out what's really in common. Uh, so, so one thing we finally decided is we're sick of all the, everyone thinking that it's all about amber here, right? You know, all our grandparents and, and their friends wearing amber jewelry all the time and, and everyone associating uh, uh, amber with, with our states. And, and also there's the fact that there's much less amber around these days. And so we, we thought uh, on a lark, I, I proposed no more amber and it turned out to be uh, the winning title in a secret, you know, secret ballot. So, so, so that's our new project. And, and it is, you know, uh, it's a very nice thing that to work together with those people and those poets and a nice collaborative project um, to try to put something together and have meetings. So, so there are those connections and other people have connections with uh, a Russian publishing house in Kaliningrad run by Georgi Eremin. Uh, who's been publishing Lithuanian poets in translation, and he's come here, and uh, we, we've had some Belarusian poets come here, uh, um, not just Maria Malinovskaya that you know, but uh, Sabrina Brillo uh, was translated into Lithuanian, she came and visited, and, and there's a lot of political support and cultural support now for, for, for the Belarusian people resisting Lukashenko. So, so there's definitely, you know, the, the, these ties and connections with uh, our neighborly nations here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It doesn't just depend on the politicians. Uh, uh, we're, we're making our own cultural ties, no matter what, you know, the politicians might say or do. Um, mm. Well, that's wonderful to hear. I mean, it's been my experience that every nation in the Baltic is really radically different. I mean, obviously you have an individual experience as, a, as a, an outsider and also who you meet defines what you do. And for example, you were very generously part of this event I organized in Vilnius in 2019, almost exactly a year ago. And um, when people say to me, oh, Vilnius, it'll be reserved and people will be <laughs> quiet and, and melancholic. And then it was a, a furious, uh, energized um funny evening and and so i think as an outsider my perception's off but i've really noticed that it's incredibly different culturally and in tone between the three baltic nations and it it, it is rather strange that that there is this kind of cultural lumping um and a bit unfortunate but also maybe useful in terms of sharing uh, cultural ideas um i'd love to jump on to talk about your work i mean one of the things i wanted to ask you is whether or not, 
I mean, I've heard this from other translators, like someone like George Schurters, who we've met, mentioned a couple of times, who obviously has done incredible jobs of translating Hungarian poets, but also say like Laszlo Kresna Hawkeye, like incredible novelists. And I was asking whether or not the process of translation is like a ghost, you know, that then seeps into his own writing. He's a very prolific uh, poet. So I wonder if that happens to you. Do, you. do you choose certain poets because of certain things that are going on with you creatively? Or is there a, a leeching in, in your, in your style, which comes from that process? Uh, those are good questions, and, and it's, uh, it, it's not so easy to answer them. Uh, I, I've, uh, what, what's often happened is uh, when I try to, when I think I've written a, a real Lithuanian poem, uh, I show it to, say, my friend, uh, the poet and translator, Marius Burokas, and he's like, no, it's not so Lithuanian. <laughs> it's still American, you know, and, and, uh, and I think that, that it doesn't happen fast, right? I mean, uh, your, your long-term cultural roots and, and the, the literary culture you grew up in is, is really quite dominant. Uh, but I, I think there is a subtle influence and, and it happens slowly and over time. Uh, and, it, and it's maybe you know, too hard for me to see it now. I think maybe, maybe there's there's a slight change in my work that's happening that might be more Lithuanian in style. But it's, you know, it'll take some time and some distance for uh, to see whether that's really the case. And, and uh, you know, it sometimes happens that I just, you know, love a certain poet, even if they're different from mine. And uh, I really feel a need to translate it. And uh, I'm not sure where that need comes from always, you know. Uh, even if they're different, but somehow you feel a certain power to it and a, and a certain creative spark and you just want to be part of that and you want to hear it in English, right, in your head. And uh, that might not have any influence in the end. Uh, it might, it's hard to say. Um, uh, you know, certainly poets like Thomas Benslov I've been reading for a long time and, and it's maybe easier for him to influence me a little bit um, you know, I sometimes write in, in form and in rhyme, and, and he often does too, but not always. And uh, there could be something there in terms of mood as well. And, and because he was uh, he was in exile for many years in America, and and, and I, I've always felt uh, you know drawn to the to those poems too, the the poems of you know being distant from your homeland. Um, but there's other poets who are just, you know, just wow me. And, and I'm, it's harder to say, right, where that comes from. And I, uh, the need to translate them, too. Um, I, I have one, actually, I, I was working on recently. And uh, I could share it to you just to show how, how it's rather strange work. And uh, it's a poet, Kistutis Navakas, who uh, passed away in the beginning of this year. Uh, not from COVID, but before COVID. And uh, he passed away too young. He was in his 50s. Um, but he was writing really strange and weird and wonderful poems at the end of his life. And it, it's, it's uh, almost hard to get your finger on what, where they're coming from and how they are the way they are. And I actually tried to imitate it. And it was a total failure. I, I, I just can't do it, right? It's just different. But I keep wanting to translate it. And I published... I've published some uh, with Shearsman magazine in the UK and, and Southward in Ireland in the Paris Review from America. Uh, and so I'm working on actually trying to get a manuscript together. Uh, wow. I would like to publish, uh, that would be the next book I would like to publish of translated poems. So I'll just read uh, one just to give you a sense of, you know, how it's, it's I think, weird and wonderful. Um, it's called, the poet is Kistutis Nabakas. The poem is called Life. I was cooking soup, cutting celery. My knife stabbed a random passerby and his body sap dripped onto my outstretched hand. It was a nice day, no snow yet. The passerby lay facing the feathery clouds, then got up and left. He had some stuff to do. The bricks of the building next door reflected the plum tree in my courtyard. Its blossoms long fallen, it has shed whatever it had. A caravan of camels passed in the street with a load of salt and saffron. I gazed at the trees in the courtyard. I read a book. 
I cooked soup. My love will return from work and have something to eat. I observed the strangest beetles and thought about the life they led. I cooked soup. There will be a meal. I didn't do anything. I lived. I loved. I died. I lived again. Wow, they're incredible. That's really a beautiful, uh, beautiful poem, like expressionistic and improvised, slightly surreal, imagistic. And this was written at the, e the end of his life? Yeah, yeah, that's from his, uh, it was at his last manuscript that is now published, but uh, it was still unpublished at the time. And, and uh, his last readings were, uh, were uh, in the Druskininkai Poetic Fall Festival, uh, November or October of last year. Uh, of 2019, and, and he had sent me part of that manuscript uh, to translate, so, so I had a look at it and uh, was able to translate some poems from that, um, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, that was uh, the last sort of three years of his life. He's been sort of working up to this strange style. As you said, it's hard to place. It's like sort of surreal, expressionistic images. I mean, what exactly is it? It has some of all of those features to it. Um, and, uh, and it's rather unique and, and, and nobody really writes like that exactly. And, and so, so, yeah, I'm trying to bring it to the world. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a real sense of responsibility. I mean, without being too grand, you're, you're almost giving his work a, another life, you know, beyond, beyond his own life. You are, you are in a sense, doing a, a real service of, of, of something to, to, that, to that poet. It's extraordinary. Well, yeah, I do feel that because, you know, we had talked about it. Uh, uh, we had actually planned a, a book that selected from his, you know, basically his last three books, including this one, the posthumous one. And, and we had planned it and, and thought it would be a good uh, selection. And, and, uh, and then he passed away. And, and uh, so he didn't get to see it happen. And, and I do feel that responsibility to keep carrying on, you know, and, and, and get it out there at some and point. I can imagine how that must have also then affected, as you said, your own writing. You know, you start to play in that in that extraordinary legacy that, that he left you. I don't suppose you have some of your own poems that you'd be willing to read. I do. Uh, uh, they're not like that. <laughs> uh, I, I tried, as I said, to 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 write that way and uh, it didn't work. <clears throat> um, uh, but I, I could read one, say that's uh, a newer poem, uh, not from my book, but that was published. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a quarantine poem, and it was published by Lit Magazine out of Manhattan. Um, so maybe I'll read that. Uh, I guess people can relate uh, if we're not all sick of quarantine poems. Um, that's it's perfect. Called, it's Thank called you. Qu Quarantine. <clears throat> by day, we count like clocks the dust motes and wait for the hour of maximum sun, when the forest folds us in like the first morning, Eve yet to meet a snake. The passage back is through the cemetery, haunted by the occasional human, shuffling from grave to grave, pottering with plants and sloughed pine. We park ourselves before electric iridescence, trying to feel our way towards a future, Seeing only fear and desire and no eightfold path, seeing only ourselves. Someone laughs, the innocent madness of the pram. No one weeps, not yet, so early in the days counted like motes stuck in our eyes. We wash them out, we wash and we wash and we wash our sins out. But we still can't see the life we imagined we led. It's nothing. The spider weaves her web. Oh, that's fantastic, Remus. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Have you been writing a lot during the uh, unnameable? <laughs> I, I did. You know, in the spring, I didn't have a, a very heavy teaching load. And so I was, I was reading and writing a lot in the first quarantine. Um, and, and in the summer, too, I, I was able to keep doing some writing. Uh, and in this fall, it got it got tough because I have a, a pretty serious teaching load and, and a lot of translation to do. And, and so it's, it's been mostly this fall uh, working on older poems, revising them, sending them out, uh, you know, and it hasn't been as much in terms of new, new creation. And I'm not writing about quarantine anymore. 
<laughs> I, I wrote a few poems based on that and, and I said enough, I don't, I don't want to anymore, you know. I wouldn't say that was a typical quarantine poem from what I've read. I think you, you did a, a really beautiful, elusive job with, with what the unnameable has been doing to us all. Um, and have, have you been teaching translation? Is that your main area of, of teaching? Because I read that you taught translation at Vilnius University. Is that correct? Yes, yes. I'm in the translation department uh, and uh, I teach a class on culture and translation and a class on uh, the translation of contemporary Lithuanian literature into English very long title <laughs> and uh, and I also teach some practical translation to master's students but uh, this year the English department lost uh, a teacher to a, a sabbatical or a postdoc position and uh, they asked me to teach creative writing in their department uh, which I, I decided yes I, I missed I used to teach in the English department years ago when I came here and I, I sort of really miss it because uh, I miss the students who are really into English literature, right? Uh, translation students, well, okay, they'll read some novels, they, they like that, but, but they're not really into li literature, you know? And, uh, and they've offered now for me to teach a, a, a master's seminar on 20th century English poetry for next semester. So I'm, I'm very excited to do that. You know, fi finally, uh, it's been like five years since I taught poetry. So, so, so I'm, I'm branching out now into the English department and uh, that's, that's to my benefit greatly. I'm really happy to do that. I, I think perhaps doing both, you are creating another legacy, right? With, um, with your obvious, your students in translation must know about your poetry and your own work. And then you're teaching 20th century English language. You're kind of creating people to come and do the work that you've been doing too, perhaps behind you. I don't know if you perceive it like that, but it seems that way from the outside. Well, I hope so. You know, it's, it's hard to know with these translation students. Uh, it turns out a lot of translation students uh, end up getting jobs outside of translation. You know, they just, they, uh, you know, one problem with translation jobs is they often don't pay well, right? Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a problem. And so a lot of people, are, although they're qualified, they, they just go and find other jobs that require many languages, right? Uh, language skills, uh, certainly in Europe, are still very important. And, and there's a lot of people that will pay you if you can use them. Uh, and they often pay better than actual translation. Um, uh, and and then this is, again, we were talking in the beginning uh, about English and the dominance of English. And, and part of the problem is that everyone starts to think they know English just fine. Right? And, and everyone's like, oh, we don't need to pay a translator. You know, we can do it ourselves. And, and then, you know, of course, the quality suffers. Like, we can tell the English isn't quite up to snuff, right? But, but they, everyone starts to get like, I don't really want to pay that much, right? You know, and, and so you get poor quality. And, and it's hard to know when, you know, how to change that exactly. Uh, so, so it's hard to say, you know, I, 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 one of the best young Lithuania translators I've met actually wasn't from the translation department. He's, he's studying for a master's in classics. And he never lived in Britain or America or any other English speaking country. Sorry, I don't mean to leave out Canada, New Zealand and Australia and Ireland, <laughs> but, but uh, he never lived there uh, in, in any of those places, but he, he learned English really well. And, and he, when he introduced himself to me, only wanted to speak English. And to this day, we just speak English. And, and I hold him up to my students as kind of an example. It's like, come on guys, look, you, you just have the desire, the impetus, uh, the willingness to put it out there and, and speak it and write it and, and you can get really good, you know? Uh, and he's been doing a lot of translation of essays for us in the, in the Vilnius Review, the English language publication. So, uh, so it's been a big help. And, and I've in a way been a kind of mentor for him, but not as an official professor. You know? uh, Sometimes so. that happens, you know, I think that's yeah. right. It's, I think it's the same with poets too. You know, you, you can't, I find that when I'm teaching creative writing, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. There's something in the mind that, that happens. So I'm glad that, that you have that at least, and that you're there teaching a new generation of people. And also as a practicing poet, as well as a translator, that they have that creative impetus around the idea of translation. So they know to put themselves forward and, and in the work, because that's really inspiring that you're, you're doing that. Um, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. 
we must. Yes, to you also, Stephen. Uh, we could keep talking and talking, it feels like. But... <laughs> Truly so. And that's thanks to you. Um, it's wonderful to have a chance to actually sit down and chat and get some context about your work and, and your work as a translator. And I think a lot of the things we talked about are, are relevant to most nations in Europe as it relates to English language poetry. So thank you so much for your insight. Thank you, Stephen, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Well, I hope we see each other soon in the flesh in Vilnius yes, or London or somewhere else. Yes, indeed. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Okay. Bye-bye.